The engine roars as I press the gas pedal to the floor. Hold on! I shout as we approach a gated entrance to Area 51, doing a good 80 miles an hour. I peer out a small 6 inch by 6 inch window in the windshield, just above the steering wheel. Every other part of the windshield is covered in ballistic vests, which we taped around the inside of the SUV to protect us from bullets. We'd spent a small fortune on enough vests to cover all the windows, plus one for each of us to wear. It's relatively cool inside the SUV, partially thanks to the vests blocking the harsh desert sunlight. Roy sits in the seat next to me, gripping the o handle above the window. His forearm flexes, distorting the tattoo of a bulbous-headed green alien there. Roy's blue and white bandana covers the top of his head, and his braided gray and brown goatee hangs halfway down the ballistic vest he wears. We look at each other, frightened grins on our faces. Neither one of us can actually believe we're storming Area 51. It still seems like a far-off dream, even as we race toward the no trespassing and restricted area signs. Yeah, the movement may have started off as an internet joke, but it's anything but a joke now. As soon as Roy and I arrived at the massive nearby gathering and started talking to other people, we found that we had one major thing in common, rage. We were all so sick and tired of being lied to by the government. Most of us had experienced things that couldn't be explained away, whether it was actually waking up in a spaceship with strange creatures all around us, or just something in the sky that moved in a way no Earth ship could, we all knew that the truth was out there. So when the United States government kept insisting that aliens didn't exist, we grew more and more frustrated over the years. But it wasn't just that. We also saw our quality of life decaying. Whether it was inflation making groceries more expensive, giant corporations ripping us off, or the rising cost of healthcare, we saw ourselves being squeezed for all we had. We didn't have to look far to see that the government was letting it all happen. While billions in lobbying dollars flowed into the government, our lives got worse and worse. So it didn't take long for the Storm Area 51 gathering to latch onto the Air Force Base in the middle of the Nevada desert. There wasn't much we could do about inflation or corporate greed or healthcare costs. But, by God, we could do something about this. We could show the world what all of us already knew in the deepest depths of our hearts. We could show them that aliens exist. The enlivening elixir of purpose makes me feel like a much younger man as we barrel toward the gate. Roy whoops in excitement. Although I can't see the dozens of other vehicles coming along behind us or blasting through the desert on either side, I can certainly hear them. A song plays on repeat from the speakers of an old rattletrap RV driven by a guy named Juan. The sound is swallowed up by metal rending as vehicles smash into the fence on either side of the gate. Roy lifts one of the ballistic vests on his side and peers out into the night. They're through, he says in his thick Texan accent. They're through, man, ha! Still peering through the small vision port, I see that we're coming to the striped barriers, but they're only wood. Before we even hit the first one, I see muzzle flashes from the guardhouse. Bullets punch into the hood and windshield even as we crash through the wooden barriers. I duck down as the ballistic vests stop the bullets. As we pass the guardhouse, soldiers fire at Roy's side of the vehicle. He grasps his head in his arms and shouts in a mixture of fear and excitement. When the SUV is no longer getting hit with bullets, I look over at him. You good? He feels himself for bullet holes, looks at me and grins. We both burst out laughing. Then Roy reaches into the back and grabs one of the multitude of weapons we've brought. I stop laughing, thinking about how I don't want to kill anyone. I don't understand why they won't just let us see what's inside. I'm so sick of the government's secrets, but I never wanted things to get violent. Well, there's no turning back now. I can see the cluster of buildings all lit up in the distance. A siren sounds as we head down the long straight road. A couple of bikers roar past on their motorcycles, swerving in front of me and powering toward the buildings, their leather vests flapping in the desert wind. There's a distant crack, and one of the bikers suddenly goes down. I swerve, trying to miss him, but the right side of the SUV bumps sickeningly over him. Shit! Roy yells. What the hell was that? 
A person, I say, my own voice sounding strange. They got snipers. Those motherfuckers, Roy says. The other biker gets shot and goes down, but I swerve around him. As we get closer to the nearest building, I see dozens of young guards run out. We call them camo dudes. They are private military contractors. They take cover behind concrete dividers placed around the parking lot. Get ready, I say, slowing and then jerking the steering wheel left, bringing the SUV to a sliding stop with the passenger side facing the buildings. I slam the vehicle into park and then jump out, yanking open the back door and grabbing an M4 carbine while Roy clambers over the center console and gets out of the vehicle on my side. The camo dudes are already firing, their bullets thudding into the side of the SUV. Roy crawls to the front wheel and pokes his gun over the hood, taking a couple of shots. All around us, other vehicles are coming to a stop. Men and women with guns jump out and fire on the soldiers. To my left, Jacob and his girlfriend Liliana pull up in Jacob's American flag truck and jump out. Liliana takes a bullet to the chest as she gets out. Jacob screams when he sees this, firing his AK-47 wildly at the camo dudes. I grab my rifle and add my bullets to the fray, not really trying to hit any of them, but happy to provide covering fire. Soon, the camo dudes are overwhelmed. As they run back toward the building, many of them are shot in the back. Let's go! Someone shouts. Everyone runs out from behind their vehicles, shouting, determined to get in there and find the truth about aliens, and to see what else the government has been keeping from us. Glancing left and right, I see a line of raggedy-ass civilians, many of them wearing bullet-resistant vests and old fatigues bought from military surplus stores. A second surge of purpose swells my heart. I never thought I would be part of something so big, something so noble. A couple of younger men get to the building entrance first. The metal doors are locked from the inside, but a guy with a shotgun steps forward and blasts one of the doors where the hinges are. He moves aside as another guy rushes forward with a crowbar and jams it at the top of the door. Roy and I are standing to the side of the entrance, waiting and buzzing with excitement. Many of the other stormers are running toward other buildings or hangars. Gunfire sounds from all around us, along with the occasional scream, adding noise to the constantly wailing siren. Just before the crowbar guy levers the door out, I notice that several people are standing in a straight line with the door. I shout for them to move, but the door is already falling. The crowbar guy steps out of the way. Dozens of weapons fire from inside the building, perforating those people I just screamed at. They stumble and fall, two of them with giant holes in their heads. Someone throws a flashbang into the building. As soon as it explodes, those nearest the door rush inside. Roy and I follow along despite the gunfire coming from inside. By the time we get into the building, we see that most of the camo dudes are lying dead on the floor in the large entryway with a desk and a waiting area. A pair of glass doors and a wall between the desk and the waiting area are lined with bullet holes. The glass is ice white with spider webs. Since those are the only doors visible, everyone runs through them, stepping over dead camo dudes. There's a large room through the doors, lined with a bunch of cubicles, each of which contains a computer. Little knickknacks adorn the desks, which are all otherwise very clean and tidy. People fan out, searching for something that will tell us our raid hasn't been for nothing. Roy and I wander around, looking in the various rooms that other people have already looked in. We find nothing but bathrooms, a supply room, and a server room. When we've checked seemingly the whole building, we all gather in the cubicle room, everyone looking defeated. Roy and I stop at the side of the room next to a wall. I lean against a dark blue file cabinet. My surge of purpose fades away, leaving me feeling something like despair. Check the computers, someone says. They're all password protected, someone else answers. I tried. Who's got a radio? Roy calls. See if anyone else has found anything. A woman named Sherry props her AR-15 on one shoulder and grabs her radio off her belt. We listen as she calls out to the others, asking if anyone has found anything interesting. It takes a moment, but people start to answer. No one has found anything that can be conclusively linked to aliens. I shake my head, looking down at the floor. 
noticing for the first time the tracks we've left all over the place on the thin industrial carpeting. Tracks left thanks to the sandy desert soil. Well, this place is huge, Roy says. Let's keep looking. Wait, I say, stepping around to the front of the file cabinet. There's another metal cabinet right next to it, and they're both large, coming up to my shoulders. Check this out. Roy comes closer, looking to where I'm pointing. What the hell? He says. There's a boot print there, half hidden by the file cabinet. It looks as though the cabinet was put there after someone left the boot print, but that doesn't make sense. Other people are gathering around now, trying to see what's going on. Let's move these, I say, setting my rifle aside. Roy and I try to drag one of the cabinets away, but it won't budge. It feels like it's bolted down. Suddenly, both cabinets move, sliding away from each other on unseen tracks to reveal a low doorway in the wall. How did you do that? I ask, looking around. The only answers I get are shrugs and dazed looks. Meanwhile, people are already going through the low door and down the metal stairs immediately inside. Everyone heads down. Roy and I share a look and then follow them down. The staircase doubles back on itself about a dozen times before we get to the bottom. We move through a doorway and into a massive hangar-like area. My mouth drops open as I look around. There are stations arrayed around the space with large, clear boxes containing strange-looking pieces of technology. Outside these boxes of various sizes are stands with buttons and joysticks on them, clearly used to control the robotic arms that hang over these strange pieces of alien technology. I find myself laughing giddily. Other people, now over the initial shock, jump around and laugh and titter with joy as they take pictures and hug their friends and say, I fucking knew it! There's no cell service down here, but we take pictures to eventually share on social media when we get back topside. While Roy and I take pictures of one of the clear boxes that looks like a lava lamp, I feel the ground shake slightly. The hum of powerful motors comes from the other end of the space. Everyone looks toward the source of the sound, over at a set of huge metal doors on the opposite wall. The doors are sliding apart, revealing a dark space behind them. The whole crowd, which must be nearly a hundred people, mills toward these doors, some of them raising their rifles, while others are too awestruck to do anything but stare. The doors finish opening, and I can see a large shape in the dark of the other room, but it's hard to make out. A glowing red dot about the size of a basketball appears on the large shape. A high-pitched hum resounds through the place. Then a laser show blasts out of the glowing red dot, shining on every person in the place before disappearing. I look down at the spot on my chest where one of the red beams of light touched me. There's nothing there. No sign anything ever happened. Then there's a wet splatting sound from up ahead. Everyone starts screaming as I look back up and see a man explode in a shower of blood and viscera. Everyone's exploding like overfilled water balloons pricked with a needle. It's like a wave going from those nearest the mysterious thing in the dark hangar toward Roy and I, near the back. Several people turn to run, but it's no use. They explode. Roy and I look at each other. Before I can open my mouth to say something, he explodes. Then I feel something happening deep in my chest, and I... There's only one cattle ranch next to the Air Force installation known as Area 51 and it has been in my family since shortly after the Air Force moved into the place. Since it's the middle of the desert, many people are surprised to find that there's a cattle ranch there. After all, most people think of cattle ranches as being places with lots of natural grass, like Nebraska or Kansas. But my grandfather bought the land and did the hard work of irrigation to get it ready for cattle, and it's been going strong ever since. Not that it runs itself, Far from it. Cattle ranching is hard work. I can confidently say that we do things a little different on the Milford Cattle Ranch, because we have to. If not, well, I don't really want to think about what would happen if we weren't here to do what we do. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me take you through what happened so you can understand just what we have to deal with. What follows is an incident I'll never forget. 
Even if I live to be 110, I'm sure what I experienced last night will be the worst night of my life. But it could have been much, much worse. The large square hole in the dusty hillside looked much like an entrance to an old mine. Unlike an old mine, the wooden support beams I could see in the moonlight looked fresh, no more than a few years old. I knew they had been replaced back in 2020. The ghostly light from the full desert moon penetrated a few feet into the tunnel before being swallowed up by the darkness within. I led the cow across the field toward the tunnel, pulling gently on the rope to keep her coming. My brother Travis and my father Edmund followed behind. We were all silent, even the cow was quiet. I had learned from a young age not to name the cows, because we always had to say goodbye to them, whether it was in the back of the cattle truck headed to the slaughterhouse or leading them to the tunnel. Still, I couldn't help what my mind did on its own. Automatically, I had deemed this cow Rosie without ever speaking a word. Poor Rosie, she had no idea what was coming. As we approached the tunnel, I could see the fence separating our property from what folks called Area 51. The tunnel led underneath that fence, but I didn't know how far it went. All I knew was that we had to bring a cow to the tunnel and get it to walk inside every full moon. And we had to do it without shining a light inside, without approaching in any motorized vehicles, and without making a bunch of noise. The first time I helped my father and my older brother do this was when I was 15. 15 was also the age my father brought my older brother in on it. This was back when I was still 13. Before that, my mother and father did it. And before that, my father did it with his father. It was a family tradition, but not one we particularly enjoyed, mostly because of the sounds that came out of the tunnel after we got the cow to walk in. They were horrific sounds. If you've never heard a cow scream, count yourself lucky. It's not a sound you're likely to forget. Both Travis and my dad carried rifles, just in case. That was one of the rules, a reason why one person could never do this alone. There always had to be a second person there with the rifle. In all the years we'd been doing it, we'd never seen whatever was inside the tunnel, not even a glimpse. As a 15-year-old kid that first time, it had taken some serious willpower to not shine a light into the tunnel. I wanted so badly to see what was in the tunnel. Only my father's stern and repeated warnings swayed me of the notion. Then, once I heard those noises after the cow walked into the tunnel, I decided I was better off not knowing. Now, 12 years later, I led Rosie to the tunnel, stopping five yards away. I glanced back to make sure my dad and brother were ready. Travis held his Ruger AR-556 rifle up and ready and pointed past me into the darkness. My dad held a radio in his hand. He nodded when I looked at him, then he pressed the transmit button and spoke into the radio. In position, he said. Copy, a man's voice said. Stand by. We stood in silence for several long moments. I glanced at Rosie, who looked up at me with her large and sad brown eyes. Feeling my insides twist, I looked up at the dark square ahead. It never gets easier, I thought. Proceed, the man on the radio said. I detached the halter from Rosie's head and then coaxed her forward. We had picked her because she wasn't stubborn. She would go where we said, and that's just what she did. She walked into the tunnel, her swishing tail the last thing to disappear into the darkness while I backed away to stand with Travis and my dad. Rosie mooed from inside the tunnel and I flinched, expecting the thrashing to start, accompanied by her screaming. But that didn't happen. She fell silent for a few moments, then mooed again. It had never taken this long. I looked at my dad, who kept his gaze fixed on the tunnel. He held the radio up near his mouth, but he hadn't yet pressed the button again. He swung the rifle off his shoulder and handed it to me. After dropping the rope and halter, I aimed the rifle at the tunnel. Rosie mooed once more, this time sounding closer. She emerged from the tunnel, walking into the moonlight as though on a pleasant stroll. Uh, 
We have a problem, Dad said into the radio. Nothing happened. Say again? The guy answered, sounding concerned. The cow! It came back out! Stand by. I could picture the guy, who I assumed was on the Air Force base somewhere beyond the fence line, talking to his superior or checking some kind of manual to find out what to do. Has this ever happened before? Travis asked. Not to me, my dad said. We fell silent again. Rosie had stopped outside the tunnel entrance and looked at us, but now she sauntered toward us. Make sure she doesn't wander off, my dad said. As I knelt to pick up the rope and halter, I noticed something on Rosie's hindquarter. There was a gash there. She was bleeding, but she didn't seem at all bothered by it. She was close now, about six feet from my father, who reached a hand out and said, That's far enough, girl. Rosie moved with the quickness I'd never seen from a cow. She jumped toward my father, front hooves hitting him and slamming him to the ground underneath her heavy body. The radio flew from his hand and landed near me. Before either Travis or I could react, four sharp segmented appendages ripped through the lower portion of Rosie's body amid a rush of blood. They curved downward and stabbed into my father's body, spearing him through. Yelling, Travis fired his weapon at the cow, blasting her with bullets as he backed away. Four more appendages, all of them dark gray underneath the blood, ripped out of Rosie on either side of her spine. Unlike the ones below, which ended in sharp points like crab legs, these featured six double-jointed fingers. Finally coming to my senses, I grabbed the radio and ran toward Travis, who was still firing and still backing away. Help! I shouted into the radio. Help us now! Travis's magazine emptied. He hadn't brought a replacement. We never did. We'd never had to fire a single shot. The creature inside Rosie pulled its legs out of my father and positioned them in the ground, lifting the cow up as though she weighed nothing at all. I stared at my father. He was clearly dead, his body a gory mess. Shoot it! Travis screamed. I dropped the radio and fired the rifle as the creature came toward us. The bullets seemed to have little effect, so I stopped firing and turned to run. Travis had already taken off and was about 10 yards ahead of me. The sound of the thing's sharp legs hitting the dirt grew closer, but I didn't dare look back. When I heard the whap, whap, whap of a helicopter, I thought the noise was coming from the creature behind me. It wasn't until the helicopter wheeled around in front of us that I realized what was happening. A bright light shone from the vehicle, illuminating the creature. Then they began to fire. A line of dirt kicked up between Travis and I as the bullets punched into the ground. They refined their aim. The bullets hit the creature, tearing Rosie's body to shreds. Travis and I kept running. The gunfire kept the creature from following. When we were far enough away, a rocket launched from the vehicle and exploded as it hit the creature. I felt the shock wave from the thing as I came to a low hill and slid down behind it. Travis did the same. We watched as the helicopter fired another rocket and then circled around, looking at the smoldering pile that had once been Rosie and whatever alien had hijacked her. Soon, several other helicopters showed up, along with guys and trucks. They established a perimeter and quickly got to work. A couple of these guys, who were dressed in fatigues but had no identifying patches, came over and told us to stay put. They stood around as if protecting us or keeping us from leaving. After about 20 minutes, a man in cargo pants and a sweater vest approached from the black SUV he'd arrived in. Gentlemen, he said, I'm sorry for your loss. What the fuck was that? Travis asked. Why didn't you warn us? The man shook his head solemnly. If only we had known. This took us by surprise as much as it did you. It seems these things are evolving in ways we don't understand. There's more of them? I asked. Why did you let one of them out? Travis interrupted. Why is it allowed to roam free like this? The man shook his head. You don't understand. We don't control them. We can't. But until now, they've been happy with the sacrificial cow once every full moon. We're going to have to reevaluate that, which means we will keep you in the loop as best we can. Wait, I said, putting a hand up. You're saying that these things can get out whenever they want, but they don't because we give them a cow once a month? It's slightly more complicated than that. 
call it an uneasy truce. We have measures in place to keep them in their colony, but we know they can overcome them if they so choose. They will suffer losses, but they can get loose if they want. So why don't they? Travis asked. That, gentlemen, is what we've been asking ourselves for years while we've been studying them. I hope this isn't the time we find out, because if they got out, the human race is in big, big trouble. I tossed the radio down onto the passenger seat and mimicked my boss's voice. Stay where you are until I tell you to move, blah, blah, blah. My name's Jordan and I look like a zombie, yada, yada, yada. Something strange happened in my stomach. Something not good. Something that made me suddenly feel bad for making fun of anyone who wore adult diapers. Oh God, I muttered, clutching my stomach as I sat in the driver's seat of the parked truck. Jordan, I didn't know you had the power to make me crap my pants, I said to no one. I'm sorry, I'll never make fun of you again. The spasm passed, the fear of unloading in my pants going with it, and I couldn't help but laugh. (laughs) Suspecting it would not be the last of this stomach problem, I decided to get out of the truck and walk around a bit. Maybe that'll help, I thought grimly. Hell, it was better than nothing. I got out of the truck, grabbing the radio and my rifle. The desert air was cool, the sky cloudless, the stars brilliant. As I walked a little way from the parked truck, I spotted a poor little cottontail rabbit lying at the bottom of the nearby fence. Momentarily forgetting about my angry bowels, I walked over and knelt next to the poor creature. God damn it, I said, looking at the electrified fence that had ended the cute little creature's life. I was always finding little creatures who'd been fried by the electric fence. I looked over my shoulder toward a large rocky outcropping that blocked my view of the Air Force base next to Groom Lake. This damn place, I thought, shaking my head. I was thinking of burying the little guy when my guts seemed to squirm inside me, feeling like they'd gone watery. I thought of the barbecue sandwich from the roadside stand I'd eaten for lunch. Still kneeling, I clutched my stomach and tried to keep from letting my bowels loose. Screw this! I said once the last spasm had subsided. I moved back to the truck, thinking about radioing Jordan to ask him if I could get back and use the bathroom. I already knew what his answer would be. I figured it was better to ask for forgiveness than permission in this case. The cool night air chilled the sweat suddenly springing up on my skin. I had already dismissed the thought of popping a squat in the middle of the desert. No one was around to see me, but I knew that no matter how careful I was, I would make a mess on my fatigues. It would be just as bad as letting loose inside my pants right where I stood. It was going to be an explosive ordeal, so I needed a proper toilet. I just hoped I could make it to one before it was too late. As I started off in the truck, bumping across the desert while the headlights picked out hardy shrubs and furrows on either side of the dirt track, my radio came to life. Castillo, why are you moving? My boss barked. All the trucks had GPS, so I knew he could see me moving. I'm sick. I gotta get to a bathroom. I don't care if you're puking your goddamn guts out. Stay put until I tell you to move. Negative, sir, I said. I'm coming in. Fire me if you want, but I'm getting to a goddamn bathroom. Before Jordan could answer, I sped around a rock outcropping, bringing one of the homey airport runways into view. Low lights lined the runway and I could see a strange-looking plane at one end, about to take off. God damn it, Castillo! Jordan yelled. I shut off the radio and tossed it aside. I didn't understand why Jordan was so insistent on keeping me and the others in our spots for this particular test flight. It wasn't like I hadn't seen other strange-looking planes taking off in my three years working on the Air Force Base. I knew the consequences of talking about anything I'd seen. I knew that I would be prosecuted and thrown in prison along with whoever I'd discussed it with. Not that there was anything to do with aliens going on. All the conspiracy theories were wrong, as far as I knew. It was just a place where the Air Force tested new planes. Still, spilling government secrets was enough to get you charged with treason in some circumstances. As I raced along the dirt track, which would take me parallel to the runway, 
I saw the plane rock back as it went to take off. It had stubby wings and two bulbous engines under each wing. Sticking out of the nose was something that looked like a large two-pronged fork. I was nearing the place where the dirt track angled to run parallel to the runway, so I saw what happened next clearly through the truck's windshield. Tendrils of purple electricity emerged from the fork at the nose, snaking between the two tongs for a moment before spilling over the sides and reaching for the engines. My stomach problem was momentarily forgotten. I slowed, watching the electric arcs dance from the fork to the four engines. This was something I'd never seen before, and the purple tendrils of electricity seemed bright in the relatively low light of the runway. The plane swished past in front of me from left to right. I watched it go, my jaw dropping open as bright, laser-like beams of light shot out from all four engines and converged at a space about 50 yards in front of the speeding plane. These beams of light swirled, creating a ragged, shifting circle in midair. The word portal came to mind, like a bright purple neon sign in my head. The truck was still moving. I hadn't completely removed my foot from the gas, but I wasn't paying attention to anything but the circle filled with the dancing light that the plane was racing toward. I missed the curve in the track and bounced into bumpy desert, getting closer to the runway. That's when something went wrong. One of the engines exploded just before the plane reached the portal. At the same instant, my truck went completely dead. The engine and the electrical system shut off. The plane slewed violently to the left, sliding off the runway and coming to a smoldering stop as my truck came to a less eventful stop on the other side of the runway. But the portal remained. And as I looked back at it, something stepped through. Sirens sounded from the building some 300 yards from the runway, but I paid them little mind. Instead, I looked at the thing that had stepped through the portal. Monster was the bright, blinking word that came to mind, followed quickly by alien. The thing was about the size of a large dog, but it walked on three irregular, hairless legs with three large toes. Its bulbous head had no eyes that I could see, but even from where I was, I could see its gaping mouth, which took up most of the head and was full of savage-looking teeth. Its skin shimmered in the dancing light from the portal, which made its color hard to see, but I thought it was a reddish-pink color. Its head swiveled around, as if testing the air, then it moved forward, hesitantly. My guts tied themselves in knots again. I reached over and grabbed the radio, turning it back on and radioing Jordan, but there was no answer. The radio was as dead as the truck. Then something else came out of the portal, something much bigger. My Adam's apple bounced in my throat as I stared out the windshield at the thing. It looked like a three-legged woolly mammoth. If woolly mammoths had four eyes, the heads of deformed sharks, and featured constantly shifting goop instead of hair. It moved forward with two legs in front and one in back. Its skin, if it could be called that, seemed to shift with the movement, like bubbly motor oil in a jostled container. Two snake-like arms suddenly emerged from the area just behind its head, jutting forward to swipe at the creature who'd come out first. The smaller monster sensed the movement and dodged ahead. Across the way, I noticed movement from the flaming plane. A man in what looked like a spacesuit jumped from the cockpit and started off toward the buildings in a run. The smaller creature noticed the man and took off after him, moving incredibly fast. Finally coming to my senses, I grabbed my rifle and exited the truck. I jumped into the back of the truck and aimed the rifle at the little monster chasing the pilot. I led the thing a bit and then fired, shifted, fired, shifted and fired again. The creature went down on the third shot. I could see a plethora of vehicles racing toward the runway from the distant buildings. Helicopters lifted into the sky. The siren still filled the air. Shifting my rifle, I aimed at the larger creature, seeing that it was moving swiftly towards me. I also noted the presence of several other creatures emerging from the portal. I shot at the large creature several times, but it seemed to have no effect. Screw this, I said jumping out of the truck bed and running away. I glanced over my shoulder, seeing the large creature gaining on me in its lunging strides. It smashed the truck aside with one of its snake-like limbs, sending the vehicle rolling away. Still running, 
I fired wildly behind me, trying not to think about the dozens of creatures now expanding out from the portal. The monster grabbed me around the waist with one of its arms, lifting me up and turning me around as it opened its shark-like mouth. Several tongues squirmed inside the mouth, like a nest of hungry snakes fighting for food. The teeth, arranged in three rows, top and bottom, looked sharp. I fired my gun into the thing's mouth, blasting some of those teeth away and piercing some of the tongues. The thing shut its mouth and shook its head. Four black eyes closed momentarily in what I took for pain. The magazine emptied, but I was still trying to fire. My stomach roiled, the watery feeling in my guts intensifying. I let the now useless gun drop as the creature opened its mouth again and lifted me over it. I struggled as it lowered me down, the tongues wrapped around my legs, the mouth began to close. Unable to hold it any longer, my bowels released. I felt the horrible warmth spill down my legs as the rows of teeth moved closer together, about to crunch down on my waist. The tongue suddenly spasmed and released my legs. The creature made some kind of pained noise and the jaw opened again quickly. The arm around my chest threw me. I flew through the desert and landed on the hard ground, knocking my breath away. I crawled over to a rocky outcropping and hid behind it as my breath returned. From there I watched as the troops converged on the creatures who'd escaped the portal. In relatively quick order, they closed the portal with some kind of strange weapon and then dispatched the creatures with other strange energy weapons I'd never seen before. Once it was clear everything was under control, I lay back on the uncomfortable ground and started to sob. The sobs quickly turned to laughter as I considered what had just happened. Soon, I was laughing so hard I thought I was going to pee my pants. I almost had a mind to just go ahead and do it. I was already covered in shit. Jordan walked up and looked down at me. A look of pure rage was present on his gray face. What the fuck are you laughing about? You caused this whole clusterfuck, you know that, right? I figured that was the case. By getting the truck too close to the strange interdimensional plane, or whatever the hell it was, I had interfered with the electronics or something. Still, I couldn't stop laughing. After a few long moments of Jordan staring down at me, I finally gasped out the words, Diarrhea saved my life! Then I fell to laughing again. Jordan sniffed the air and made a disgusted face. God damn! What did you eat, boy? Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.